Welcome to the most broken category of Dark Cloud 2. This is an old dungeon crawling action RPG released on the PS2 almost two decades ago and probably one of the most stable games I've played casually. In recent years though, the game has been broken down more and more to the point that the NA% speedrun that was at one point over 5 hours and mostly glitchless has now been dropped down to a 1 to 1 and a half hour glitchy mess, all thanks to a glitch hunter by the name of Glitch King or Pokemon Fan 4000 on YouTube. Here I will be breaking down Dark Cloud 2's any percent category, explaining how the run works, and showing off how the glitches are performed in this category, including the super glitchy manually sequence at the end. Time starts upon confirming Max and Monica's outfits. For this category and this category alone, there is one requirement for saving time, and that's to have Max start off with the leather shoes, which happens to be the default outfits. Everything else can be changed freely. This run is currently only known to work on PS4, which is what I ran this game on. The run starts off the same as any other Dark Cloud 2 category. We play as Monica here in the castle as she escapes from Griffin's henchmen. In order to defeat the soldiers here as quickly as possible, the strategy is to use two hit combos which she can cancel by quickly tapping L1 to have Monica prepare and cancel out her magic, and then starting the combo over again. It's got a bit of a weird timing to it, but doing it this way is currently the fastest known way of dealing damage. Next, we're in control of Max and progress with the story normally, talking to all the required NPCs and then getting into the scripted fight which starts off with Max running into the side and running back and doing two charge attacks to hopefully take out all the clowns. A few cutscenes and an unskippable opening song later, it's now time for the dungeon crawling. For those of you who've never played Dark Cloud 2 before, dungeons in this game are all randomly generated. Every time you enter the floor, the layout changes, and the RNG is extremely volatile. It changes every frame outside of menus, so any form of RNG manipulation is borderline if not outright impossible. Even though the layouts themselves are so random, there are a few things that are consistent. The way to progress through a dungeon is to defeat monsters until you find a gate key, which you can then use on a door to move on to the next floor. Thankfully, the enemy holding the gate key isn't completely random. Every floor has a preset list of monsters assigned to it as well as a specific monster preset as its gate key holder. This means runners go into a dungeon knowing exactly which type of monster to look for on each floor, as well as how many of that monster is there, significantly cutting down on the RNG for dungeons. There are a few other obstacles to the run such as doors which require a key found from a chest in order to open them. These are the biggest time wasters in the run, even more so in this category where we never have to open any chests. But runners in every category tend to reset if it's early enough in a run and they go through the entire floor without finding the key. Thankfully, an exit will never be behind a door barring any potential glitches with the dungeon generation, so finding a gate key outside typically makes it irrelevant. Chests can contain some goodies along the way, but it takes around 3 seconds to open a chest, and this category finishes with so little self that it's typically not worth the time picking up chests, though there are a few items that can save a good chunk of time if you get lucky. By the way, you may have noticed that I've been running diagonally this whole time. That is not by any means personal preference. You run faster diagonally in this game due to the way vectors are incorrectly added together. On PS2, this is way more obvious with a third-party controller due to the insane speeds you can get. Though even without a third-party controller, there is a significant speed boost from running diagonally. After three floors of dungeon crawling, we're finally met with the first boss of the game, Linda. A boy with a gun versus an elephant. Surely nothing can go wrong, right? Oh. Okay. This first version of Linda is impossible to kill, she is scripted to take no damage. The trigger for progressing this fight is to A, attack Linda at least once, and then B, wait a certain amount of time. There also happens to be a spot right here next to Linda's back foot where you can just stand and she'll keep trying to hit you with her nose. Once Cedric finally arrives and brings you back to his workshop, he will send you off to invent and create an energy pack for him, which will do and get a spare cannonball arms on top of it. We need to go around town taking the following pictures, an old style robot, a post, a milk can, a pipe, a belt, and a manhole cover. Using these 6 photos we can invent the 2 inventions. Next up is to buy the materials needed for inventing the energy pack and- Wait, what? There's actually a glitch with Cedric's quest here. If you invent the energy pack, then proceed to delete at least one of the 3 photos needed, then Cedric thinks you've created the energy pack already and just gives you a free one in the process. Because we don't need any of these photos anymore, I just went ahead and deleted them all. Also, I don't know why Cedric was keeping his energy pack hidden away from us, but hey, free stuff. Now with the ride pod, Linda is a walk in the park. You just go up to her and smack her with the ride pod. With Linda down, there are only two more floors to go through before the next boss fights. 
Now that we have the right pod, he'll be our main source of damage as the right pod's weapons are significantly stronger than Max's default weapons. Though in exchange, she also runs significantly slower than Max, so Max runs around and then destroys monsters on the right pod. In other categories, this is where runners would start collecting experience for the right pod in order to collect the barrel cannon. But collecting experience costs time, about 3 seconds to collect all experience after killing a monster, and it takes somewhere around 16 monsters to get all the experience depending on when monsters are killed, on top of an extra 20 or so seconds to actually buy and equip the weapon. So no experience is collected at any point. With the two floors done, it is now time for Halloween. And no, I don't mean the holiday. We've still got a few more weeks for that. I actually messed up this fight and uh, had to fight him normally, uh, so yeah, let's just cut away from this and see how the fight is supposed to look. By picking up Halloween's nose and throwing it back at him, he'll fall down on the ground. This is where we bring out the right bot to take him down in just one quick cycle. The chapter's not quite done yet, there's just one more boss fight left, the P5000 fight. This fight can be done in just one cycle, getting two bombs as quickly as possible while Flossum is on the right side of the screen, and taking him out right after he jumps over to the other side. The timing is pretty strict as you need to get the first bomb in before he starts shooting, and then throw the second one before he's done shooting. This wasn't really a great example of the fight, but you get the point, so let's just move on. We are now introduced to Monica, who is almost useless to the run. Almost. She will have her time to shine out by it very briefly, but only because we're forced to use her and not because she's any good in the run. Sorry Monica. This is where the game introduces a new mechanic, which is a third party member. These characters aren't fighters, they're residents who give various effects, and for any percent, we'll be using only two residents. We're going to start the chapter off by getting Eric to create 6 improved bombs for us, and then have Cedric repair the right pot for us, before recruiting him for safety. It only takes a few seconds to recruit him, and he basically gives the right pot an extra life to allow runners to play riskier in the dungeons. Moving on, we are now at Rainbow Butterfly Woods, the dungeon for this chapter. For the first two floors, we are again going to use the right pod for combat. Once we hit the third floor though, we are hit with the game's first red seal floor. Max is the owner of the red Ethamelia, so he is not allowed on this floor, and by extension, neither is the right pod. So we'll have to get by with just Monica alone. This floor is the main reason why we pick up the improved bombs from Eric. The gatekeeper here is a tortoise, and there are four of them. Each one dies to a single improved bomb, so best case scenario, we are left with five improved bombs, and worst case scenario, we are left with only two. Now it's time for the fishing section. Fishing RNG is usually not too bad, but there's still a decent chance the fish decide to troll you. Either refusing to take the bait, giving unrealistically short reaction times, or just flat out refusing to give your press clean which is needed in the run. After getting your press clean, it's now time to talk to Master Wu Chan who tells you about a mysterious fish in a swamp who likes poison apples. You need to get the mysterious fish out of the swamp with a poison apple which is an RNG drop, but thankfully if you don't have any, a pile of poison apples does appear next to Master Wu Chan. Returning back to the town of Sindane, we are now introduced to a new mechanic of the game, which is Georama. This is a town building aspect of the game. You collect these rocks called geostones in the dungeons, which unlocks objects to create, as well as the conditions for progressing. All unlockables are scripted, so we know ahead of time which geostones to collect and which ones not to collect. All other categories need to collect a handful of geostones per chapter in order to complete the Georama. But here at any percent, we don't do any of that. We do need one Geozone and one Geozone only, which is on the 4th floor after Fish Monster Swamp. So now it's time to blow through the next 3 floors using a combination of improved bombs and the right pod. Any spare improved bombs should be used on the first 2 floors for some small time save. The 3rd floor is the most annoying one out of the bunch, as we had to kill a small flying enemy called the Pixie, which is usually easy to deal with the Barrel Cannon, but since this route doesn't get it, it's a massive RNG point in the run. If you don't get lucky enough, you'll end up losing more time than you save from skipping the barrel cannon. Once we have reached the 4th floor, the goal is to find the Geozone and skedaddle on out of here. No gate key needed. This Geozone is important because it unlocks the Georama condition for having residents living in Sindane, which by extension unlocks the quest for recruiting Gordon, who then unlocks the ability to recruit all the other residents. There's only one resident needed for this run and that's Adele, so we'll be recruiting Gordon and Adele who thankfully both have easy recruitment requirements. Gordon wants a holy water which we can buy at the church, but it's also an RNG drop coming from monsters such as bats in chapter 1 or face of in chapter 2, so it's ideally found somewhere along the way. Adele wants a sturdy cloth, thick hide, and a hunk of copper in order to create a pair of overalls for Max, which is actually the only reason why we need Adele in the run. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for, it's time for the really long menuing sequence. The first step of this menu is to spectrumize anywhere from 11 to 20 rolling logs and put the resulting synth sphere on the second slot of the 10th row. Next is to go to Polly's Bakery and get a total of 21 bread. 
The game only allows you to have 20 bread at once, but if you grab part of the stack of bread, swap that with any item in the inventory, and then hold left while swapping at the left side of the shop here, you can actually bring some of the bread into the shopping menu, which lets you buy even more bread than intended. With 21 bread in the inventory, the next step is to go into the make menu. This is a convenient time to make the energy pack and the cannonball arms as well, since you had to come in here anyways. But the next step for this is to take all but one of a stacked item, swap it with the stack of 20 bread, and cancel to swap it with the original stack of items. Swap this with the single bread, and press O to cancel again to glitch up the return position of the stack of 20 bread. Now, going into the item menu, move over to the right pot screen and pick up the 20 bread. By swapping this with Max's new outfits we get from Adele and pressing O to cancel, the game tries to return the outfit to the make menu version of the inventory, which isn't possible to do. Hover over the right pod and press X to swap with Max's current outfits. And now take any useless item like this piece of glass and press O to now get a Type 0 gun. This is a poly version of the Equip Anything glitch. I don't know the specifics of why this glitch works exactly, but we're glitching the return position of the cursor to a specific slot in memory that corresponds to the data between the 2nd and 3rd slot of the 10th row. Think of this as an invisible slot overlapping these two slots. In this situation, I used a Sin Sphere with 0 Cyclone and 24 Smash. This means that in this invisible slot was an item that is Type 0 with an ID value of 24, which is a trumpet gun. Every item in the game starts with 3 values. Those are the Type, the ID, and the Property. Type is used to indicate whether an item is a weapon, a synthesis item, a fish, etc etc, and therefore dictates what format the item's data is in. For ID, every item in the game has a unique ID. This is a very common practice in games, so we can use a list of all item IDs to figure out what item each ID corresponds to. The item's property value indicates what additional property the item has, such as whether you can use a repair powder on it, whether it disappears or not when you enter or exit a dungeon, and so on. Now, back to the menu itself. The reason why this Type 0 gun is so important is that this unlocks a faster method of doing the Equip Anything glitch. Instead of going into Polly's shop, buying more bread, and doing all the stuff in the Make menu, it's now been simplified to taking part of the stack of items, swapping it twice with the gun, equipping the gun, switching over to the right pod and grabbing the outfit. Cancel, equip it on the right pod, and then swap this with another item. It's a lot of inputs all done in quick succession, but it's also much easier and much faster to do. As you can see, I pulled out a stinger wrench in only a fraction of the time it took me to make the gun in the first place. Now, with this stinger wrench in hand, it's onto the next glitch, which is equipping anything as bait. By grabbing bait off of the fishing rod, swapping with another item, and then canceling, you can put any item you want on the fishing rod. If you then equip another weapon to take the fishing rod off and select Remove Bait in its menu, you can factory reset the item. This adds a lot more leeway to the menu, as there are definitely times where you want a normal item as opposed to one with ridiculous type or property values. Now, remember how I said the Sin Spheres were Type 2 and that we used the Smash value of the Sin Sphere to create items? Well, guess what else is Type 2? Crystals. This time, let's create a bunch of special crystals. By glitching any normal Type 3 weapon onto the Stinger Wrench and then glitching the Stinger Wrench onto any other Type 2 item like the Sea Dragon Crystal, I've now set the Cyclone, Smash, and Exorcism values to 3, 4, and 1 respectively. We use the Stinger Wrench to create those crystals because it has an ID value of 4, so we can use these to create any item from 4 to 400 that has an ID that is a multiple of 4, which coincidentally works out with a lot of important IDs. You can only spectrumize up to 100 crystals at a time, so we can't just make one crystal with an ID of 1 to create every single item in the game, unfortunately. Also, the battle wrench I shoved onto the singer wrench causes the crystal to get duplicated for 16,000, which I then reset to 999 by picking it up and putting it back down. This is an important step because the game doesn't like it when you're beyond capacity for items and prevents certain actions such as exiting out of the menu or renaming items. With these special crystals, it's time to create a bunch of items. The goal for this menu is to create a Type 3 weapon with 28,593 chill, 55 lightning, and 3 cyclone. Unequip all of Max and Monica's outfits and unequip their right hand weapons. We're going to spectrumize these special synth crystals to create the following items. Another singer wrench, a striped ribbon, a grade 0, dragon shoes, a striped dress, a name change ticket, a fashionable cap, gladius, and spike boots. Next, we're going to equip an item onto Monica's weapon slot, which is done again through the use of our trusty Type 0 gun. This gives us a sword that Monica was holding before, as well as letting us equip the striped dress onto Monica's item slot. Next, we need to get exactly 3 exorcism on the Grade 0. While the special Sin Sphere from earlier has 1 exorcism each, the Grade 0 only has 2 synthesis points, which isn't enough. So we'll make another special Sin Sphere. 
To create a Sin Sphere with 3 Exorcism, we'll need to take Monica's Longsword from earlier and glitch it onto a Sin Sphere. Monica's swords have an innate property value of 3, and their property value is tied to a Sin Sphere's Exorcism value. By glitching this sword onto the Sin Sphere, we've now got a Sin Sphere with 3 Exorcism and a bunch of other irrelevant stats. After spectrumizing this onto the Grade Zero, we'll now equip this onto Monica's outfit slot. By using the Equip Anything glitch and then using the Energy Pack on the right pod instead, we can pull out items from Monica's outfit slot. So we use the Type 3 item's Exorcism value for the item's type, and the Beast value for its ID. These values are not located in the same place as Sin Sphere's Exorcism and Beast value, so spectrumizing a bunch of Hunter Crystals does not lead to a similar result. By glitching a Sin Sphere onto the slot here, we use the Grade Zero stats to create a Type 3 Machine Gun Arm, as well as glitching on a Sin Sphere. Equipping Monica's dress back on normally gets us the Grade Zero back, which we're going to rename 7. That's 7 O's followed by the number 7. We can put this back onto Monica and pull out a Sin Sphere with 28,527 Chill, 55 Lightning, and 3 Cyclone, which is just a bit off from what we need. The Type 3 Machine Gun Arm is important because normal Type 3 weapons have cap stats. The absolute highest value for any singular stat is 500 for the best weapon out there, but when you create Type 3 versions of items that aren't maxed for Monica's weapons, their stats are uncapped and can go all the way to a 2 byte integer's max value. We need to spectrumize this Sin Sphere onto the Machine Gun Arm. But in order to do that, we'll need some spectrumization points. There's a handful of ways to do it, but the fastest way for us is to glitch a ride pot weapon onto it, so we'll use the cannibal arms we created earlier on in the menu. By glitching this onto the special machine gun arm we created, the attack stat of the cannibal arms becomes the synthesis points of the machine gun arm. We can now spectrumize the sin sphere onto the machine gun arm, now creating a weapon that is 66 chill short of what we need. By spectrumizing in the 20 water elements we got from the story and 13 more tasty waters which we can buy from Polly, we'll now be at the correct value. Now for the final step of this menu, we need to unequip Max and Monica's outfits and their melee weapons. In doing so, we'll be turning them both into these weird glitchy triangles since the game doesn't know how to handle Max and Monica not wearing an outfit. Now that this is done, it's time for the more nerve-wracking part of the menu, which is opening and closing the menu 797 times. No, that is not a joke, we actually have to open and close the item menu exactly 797 times. And also during this time, if you at any point exit out of the main menu, you'll have to start to count all over again. Fun, right? Every time you open and close a menu, the location of the item menu ships over by 128 bytes in the game's memory. By doing this 797 times, we'll shove the item menu so far that we can reach the part of the memory that deals with the make menu's cursor location. Thankfully, there is a visual cue for when you've reached the 797th open, which gives you about 50 or so closes worth of leeway. Anywhere from the 740th to 791st menu open onwards, you can equip the leather shoes. This will slow down the rate at which you can open and close the menu, so the closer you hit 791, the better. But with the leather shoes equipped, your guild account will turn to zero at the 792nd open. Next, it will turn into this obscenely high number, followed by three more opens at zero guilda. And then on the 797th open, it will be back to this obscenely high number again. With the make menu's cursor glitched up, we're going to go up 38 rows and swap around these two invisible items, and then start moving another item 12 rows up to change the item menu's cursor position. From here, we're now going to open and close the menu again for 244 times. And now the menu is also going to be a lot slower thanks to Max having shoes equipped. At the 244th open, there will be a battle wrench. By picking this up and swapping it with the special machine gun arm we created, the data in the weapon has changed a bike in the game's memory to activate debug mode. Debug mode includes a set of tools that the devs and the QA testers use to test the game. The existence of this menu has been known for years and has been used extensively for routing purposes, but it is now possible to activate it from the game directly without using cheat codes. At this point, we'll use debug mode to reset the inventory to fix a lot of the glitches that came along with the setup and then warp straight to the final boss. This final fight is done by using debug mode to give Monica a maxed out love armband and a stamina drink to defeat Dark Element in just a few seconds. And there you have it, Dark Cloud 2 Any% done in 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 36 seconds. 